Hello, my name is Mary Rose, and welcome to The Billion Dollar Painting. Chances are the first work of art that will sell for one billion dollars is already out there. Today we're going to talk about Triptych, May June 1973, by the Irish artist Francis Bacon. We'll hear a story of love and loss in the London criminal underground, and we'll ask why collectors love artists who create work that isn't just esoteric, it's also sometimes downright gross. Above all, we'll ask if this Francis Bacon work could become the first billion dollar painting. As always, you can find accompanying pictures and further reading for today's show on our website, BillionDollarPodcast.com. Today, I'd like to introduce you to the artist Francis Bacon. In the last interview he gave during his lifetime to Francis Giacobetti in 1991, the interviewer asked Francis Bacon what he believed in. In response, Bacon answered, quote, I believe in being selfish. I have only myself to think of. I have hardly any family left and very few friends that are still alive. And a painter works with his human material, not with colors and paintbrushes. It's his thoughts that enter the painting. But I don't expect any certainty in life. I don't believe in anything, not in God, not in morality, not in social success. I just believe in the present moment, if it has a genius, in the spinning roulette ball, or in the emotions that I experience when what I transmit onto the canvas works. I am completely amoral and atheist, and if I hadn't painted, I would have been a thief or a criminal. My paintings are a lot less violent than me. Perhaps if my childhood had been happier, I would have painted bouquets of flowers. Unquote. This interview was given 20 years after the painting that we'll discuss today was created. And if Bacon believed what he really said in the interview, we'll be able to train our sights on one of the last times he thought of someone else in an honest and authentic way. You might say that we'll look at the moment when the light went out. You might already be familiar with Francis Bacon's life and work, but if you are not, we can start with the basics. He was born in Ireland on October 28, 1909. He was what you might call a disaffected youth. He showed some artistic promise at a young age, but he could never settle on themes that he would like to paint. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, he worked various odd jobs, including as an interior decorator, of all things. It wasn't until 1944 that Francis Bacon really got his artistic career underway. He created three figures at the base of the crucifixion, which set the stage for his iconic style. Bacon was inspired by Picasso's biomorphs, that is, these kinds of amorphous, undulating, not quite human figures who nevertheless are the actors on the canvas. He incorporates these biomorphic figures into religious works during the early parts of his career, and he especially began to develop this affinity for paintings composed of two or three panels, his iconic diptychs and triptychs. Diptychs and triptychs have a long history, but today the most iconic of them are medieval altarpieces. They're a very religious-associated work, and so it's no surprise that he was drawn to them when he began exploring religious themes. These paintings allowed Bacon to explore different variations or aspects of the same themes or scenes, but on each of the different panels, and he often made them quite large indeed. In the painting that we're discussing today, the panels were each 198 centimeters tall by 147.5 centimeters wide. That's about 6.5 feet tall by 4.8 feet wide. Bacon really enjoyed working large. And he had really hit his stride by the 1960s. He was granted a retrospective at the Tate Museum in 1962, and afterward met an intriguing man at a bar. Bacon was openly gay, or as openly as you could be in the 1960s in London. And when a handsome stranger walked up to him and asked to buy him a drink in his East London accent, Bacon readily accepted. The man's name was George Dyer, a rough-and-tumble, sometime gangster, and they would become lovers for much of the next decade. During that time, Francis Bacon began painting portraits. He created many different versions of paintings of Dyer, who was in many ways his ideal man, masculine, handsome, not terribly intellectual. 
but he also created paintings of their close friends, including the painter Lucian Freud, the photographer John Deacon, and model Henrietta Mores. Still, despite this light in a dark time during his life, Bacon continued to be troubled. Lifetime alcoholism and gambling troubles made him extremely volatile. He was very prone to fights, often physical. Art historians have long read various psychoanalysis into his work because it's so disturbing. It really does beg the question what he was thinking. Which is pretty fitting since he was friends with Lucian Freud, the grandson of Sigmund Freud. For instance, Bacon was famous for destroying paintings that didn't meet his expectations. Now, that in itself isn't unusual, but where another artist might paint a white base coat over the canvas to start over again, or cut the entire canvas out to reuse the wooden stretcher, Francis Bacon would simply slash out the offending faces and leave the rest of the canvas intact, not making use of the stretchers or canvases at all. And so read into that what you will. In 1971, Bacon received the news that he had really been waiting for his entire career. He was to have a retrospective in Paris, still a major art world center for Europe, and it would be held in the Grand Palais. This kind of retrospective was extremely validating. Bacon had received his fair share of success in the 1950s and 1960s, but he had many detractors and critics as well. His work is hard to look at. It's often deliberately ugly or disturbing. But modern artists have been pushing the envelope of what was considered acceptable for decades at this point. The works of Cubists like George Brock or Pablo Picasso, the Surrealists like Juan Miro and Max Ernst, had been considered ugly at first, but they were gradually receiving more and more support from the kind of broader intelligentsia of the 20th century. Across the pond, abstract expressionists like Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock were fighting for their own recognition. And you can see when you compare the works of people like Rothko and Pollock with someone like Bacon that they're very preoccupied with abstracting human forms and complicating what you might think of as the traditional composition with a foreground, middle ground, and background. To Bacon, the retrospective at the Grand Palais would bring him into the fold and hopefully guarantee a brighter future for himself and his artwork, even maybe for Dyer, who at that point he was financially supporting. Just as Bacon was walking through the door of the exhibition, he was pulled aside and informed that George Dyer was dead. Dyer had overdosed on pills in their shared hotel room. Art historian and Bacon's close friend of over 30 years, Dr. Michael Pepiat, recalled that Bacon was utterly shattered by Dyer's death, but that he went on with the exhibition as he was expected to. He mingled, he drank. He seems to have pushed the suicide to the back of his mind, locked it away so that it wouldn't trouble him while he was working. But the party had to end, and Bacon had to face the facts. His lover of nearly a decade was gone. The death ate at him and Bacon created a cycle of paintings that are today some of his most famous. They are nine paintings altogether, three sets of triptychs, and they're called the Black Triptychs. The first triptych is called In Memory of George Dyer, and shows the amorphous form of Dyer moving through a kind of semi-domestic pink landscape plane of color with a stable, basic kind of layout, even a set of stairs that you can pick out, and doorways as well. So you do get the sense that although it's abstract, it is representative of a place. You get the impression of Dyer in life, glimpsed through this kind of haze of Bacon's memory, and it's currently housed in the Baylor Collection Museum in Basel, Switzerland. The second work, called Triptych August 1972, shows a few scenes of both Dyer and Bacon. The walls of the room that is shown in the three paintings are tan, and the figures are framed in a black doorway. Art historians Beth Harris and Steve Zucker point out that the lone figures on the left and the right panels are representations of Dyer, based on photographs they were taken of him by their friend John Deacon. The individual Dyer portraits are amorphous, accompanied by these kinds of gelatinous purple entities that seem to ooze from him or beset him in turn. They could be vomit, urine, or just his shadow, depending on which analysis you read. 
The central panel is more abstract. It's a little more complicated to figure out, but it depicts Bacon and Dyer entangled together, almost melding into one another in a carnal act. If you look at their faces, you can see that just like Picasso would often split faces in half and complicate the face with one profile being someone and one profile being someone else, one is Bacon and one is Dyer. This triptych is housed in the Tate Modern in London. The final painting is the one that we're going to discuss today. It's called Triptych, May-June 1973, and shows Dyer after death. I find this one the most powerful because it's what Bacon might have seen after ending the party at his exhibition when he opened the door to the hotel room and saw Dyer's body for himself for the first time. The room is the same as in the previous August triptych, but the walls are a warm, velvety red. In the left panel, we see Dyer sitting on a toilet, hunched over. In the middle panel, lit by a single dangling light bulb, we see Dyer's contorted face. In the final painting, he's hunched over a sink, and red blood dots his mouth. They're hard to look at, to be certain. I've heard people say that the paintings make their skin crawl, that it makes them feel dirty, that they feel like voyeurs or peeping toms looking in at Francis Bacon's psyche. There's this long tradition of feeling like the moment of death is an extremely intimate experience. It's one of the last things we really undertake by ourselves in our culture is still this moment of death. And so looking at it as a viewer, it feels like we're not quite supposed to be there. But of course, Francis Bacon has taken the opportunity to portray the death, portray the moment afterwards, and show it to all of us in this work. Why would someone own a Francis Bacon. Bacon's legacy is mixed. People remember him as being a jovial, friendly, outgoing character who nevertheless created these horrifying nightmare portraits. He painted in a wickedly messy Rhys Muse studio in London, but you won't find it there anymore. In 1998, the Hugh Lane Gallery in Dublin paid to have the studio meticulously catalogued, disassembled, and then reassembled exactly as it had been, it's quite a sight to behold, dark, gritty, messy. I'm going to link photos of it in the show notes for you all, or you can go see it the next time you are in Dublin. And so that gives you kind of a glimpse into his artistic process in his studio. But it still doesn't quite answer the question of who wants to enter into the space with him, who wants to bring his artwork home with him. When reflecting on the first time he saw Francis Bacon painting, Max Porter wrote an article for the Paris Review that I think sums it up entirely. Quote, I thought of the famously messy Rhys Muse studio. How so spotless then, here on the wall? Some trickery must be involved. Bacon must be lying to us about how he made these things. And the biographical odor creeps around the viewer's experience and pollutes it, ripens it, makes it grossly more interesting, nudging us against our better judgment into voyeurism. Bacon is quaffing champagne, hearing the terrible news. Bacon is fucking, fighting, selling, lying, twisting the body into these shapes on the canvas. But Bacon is also applying a perfect surface of unblemished oil. He is rigor, control, exactitude, and technical virtuosity. Unquote. I think Porter has really hit it directly on the nose. There's this question that we all have when we look at a Bacon artwork to wonder how someone who is painting a subject that is so violent from a history that is so violent also manages to do it with a kind of technical virtuosity. When you look at a Bacon artwork, it is not a messy canvas. It's one of the things that really distinguishes him from someone like Jackson Pollock, because Jackson Pollock's work strikes us as being very violently painted, whereas these artworks that Bacon creates are violent subject matters, but nevertheless a kind of smooth, perfected line stroke as well. By the time he died in April 28, 1992, Francis Bacon had created around 590 paintings. As I mentioned previously, many of them are part of diptychs and triptychs. And luckily for us now, collectors try to preserve the sets of paintings rather than splitting them up. This wasn't the case even a few decades ago. The most expensive Francis Bacon painting today is a triptych of portraits of the fellow artist Lucian Freud, 
After the Lucian Freud triptych had been exhibited in the fated Grand Palais exhibition in Paris, it was split up and sold to different owners in the mid-1970s. It was only in the mid-1980s that Francesco de Simone Nicesa reunited the paintings. He bought all of them and combined the set together, and they have been sold as a set ever since. Most recently, they were sold to Elaine Wynne, the ex-wife of Steve Wynne, who I discussed in the episode about Picasso's painting La Reve. Elaine Wynne paid $142 million for the Lucian Freud triptych, becoming nominally the most expensive work of art sold at auction. Although adjusting for inflation, it still did not beat out Portrait of Dr. Gachet by Vincent van Gogh for real value, taking away the inflation. Still, it bodes well that if another rarer dyer might come to auction, it could do extremely well. And that's exactly why I point to Triptych May-June 1973. It hasn't been on the auction market in quite a while, and if it were to come up, one of the great things about it is that it really does show a landmark point in his career. It's a work that's extremely important when understanding the entire oeuvre of Francis Bacon's artwork. And that is, if Triptych May June 1973's current owners decide to sell it. There's something ironic in the fact that Dyer, who died of an overdose of pills, appears in a painting owned by a cosmetic and healthcare product magnet. Esther Griether is the chair of the Dutch Griether Group, with a current net worth of $2.2 billion, and she's the current owner of the painting. The triptych also isn't the only Francis Bacon artwork in her collection. She reportedly owns three other paintings of his from the 1970s, along with a sizable collection of Pablo Picasso, Paul Cezanne, and Salvador Dali. Of course, it's going to take a certain kind of person to spend a billion dollars on a Francis Bacon. A prominent strike against Bacon is that he isn't even the first thing to show up when you Google his name. Instead, you get the Wikipedia page for Francis Bacon, the 16th and 17th century political philosopher. So there's that standing in his way. Then, you'll also have to figure out what to do with it. Bacon paintings are not house-friendly, I would say. I'm not sure what room you can put it in, certainly not a formal dining room, and I hope not in your foyer. Although, of course, the benefit to being a billionaire, I suppose, is that if you get sick of waking up every morning to a Francis Bacon, perhaps literally, you can just buy another house or put it on loan at your favorite museum. I'm obviously being somewhat facetious. I actually think that the fact that Bacon paints hard to look at pictures bodes pretty well for the Bacon market. When the person who fell in love with a painting or decided that it was important and then bought it passes on, their descendants might not be the type of person to appreciate mom or dad's old creepy Bacon painting, and they would rather have the cash. And so the fact that they are not for everybody means that somewhere along the line, someone is going to look at it and say, I don't want this at all. I'm going to sell it. So perhaps off they go to Christie's and Sotheby's. And maybe that's the reason why this painting will be the first billion dollar painting. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe and leave a five-star review. It helps more people find their way to the show. You can also find more information about the triptych and other works of art by Francis Bacon by visiting the website billiondollarpodcast.com. You can tweet at us at Billion Painting, follow our Instagram at The Billion Dollar Painting, or you can email us at The Billion Dollar Painting at gmail.com. See you next week. <laughs>